Good morning, everyone. Welcome to St. Mary Magdalene, Bermondsey on Sunday, the 15th of November, 2020. It's great to have you with us, uh, especially if you're watching us now on our YouTube channel. A warm welcome to you. I'm going to begin our worship now by reading a couple of verses from the readings that we're going to have later. When Solomon finished praying, the glory of God filled the temple. And then from Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, Jesus said, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Let us pray. God, we pray that your glory would fill your people as they worship you today. Father, we pray that we would shine brightly as lights on hills, in windows, on rooftops, in gardens, in streets, in houses, wherever we are. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes. 
God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let us then show our love for him by confessing our sins in penitence and faith. So now we have a moment of quietness as we reflect on the events of the last week, perhaps some ways in which we've hurt other people, We've done things perhaps that we regret. And we come now to God in penitence, asking for his forgiveness. And so we say together, most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with heartfelt repentance and true faith turn to him. Have mercy on us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and bring us to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The reading this morning comes from 2 Chronicles, Chapter 7, verses 11 to the end. The Lord appears to Solomon. When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and the royal palace, and had succeeded in carrying out all he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and his own place, the Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague upon my people, if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, 
and I will hear from heaven, because I have forgiven their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. As for you, if you walk before me faithfully, as David your father did, and do all I command, and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne, as I covenanted with David your father, when I said, You shall never fail to have a successor to rule over Israel. But if you turn away, and forsake the decrees and commands I have given you, and go off to serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot Israel from my land, which I have given them, and I will reject this temple, which I have consecrated for my name. I will make it a byword and an object of ridicule among all peoples. This temple will become a heap of rubble. All who pass by will be appalled and say, Why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and to this temple? People will answer, Because they have forsaken the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who brought them out of Egypt and have embraced other gods, worshipping and serving them. This is why he brought all this disaster on them. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is taken from Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 to 16. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Salt and light. You are like salt for all mankind, but if salt loses its saltness, there is no way to make it salty again. It has become worthless, so it is thrown out and people trample on it. You are like light for the whole world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a bowl. Instead, he puts it on the lampstand, where it gives light for everyone in the house. In the same way, your light must shine before people so that they will see the good things you do and praise your Father in heaven. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, God. When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground, and they worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, He is good. His love endures forever. What an amazing picture in uh, those few verses from Second Chronicles chapter 7. Those were read from verses 1 to 3, which is actually not part of the reading that Gretchen gave to us earlier. But I did want to read them because as we think about our 24-7 week of prayer coming up, I thought it was just an amazing picture uh, of, um, of what happened when Solomon finished praying. Often things don't seem to be happening when we're, when we're praying. But what we're told here is that when he had finished praying, the fire came down from heaven. God's house was filled with his glory. The priests couldn't even enter the temple because of the intensity of the fire. And the people were kneeling on the pavements praying. Can you imagine that happening on Bermondsey Street? What an amazing picture of people praying. Now we've got a, a prayer week coming up and when we finish praying, it would be amazing, wouldn't it, if people were kneeling in the streets and they couldn't even enter this building because of the intensity of God's presence. What an amazing picture. And as we move on into Second Chronicles 7, we come to the verses we had read today and the most important, important words uh, within those verses are, are very small and actually very easy to miss. But I'd like to, this morning to focus a little bit more on those particular words. And they are when, if, and then. 
when, if, and then. We've heard that when Solomon finished praying, all those amazing things happen. We hear in verse 11 that when Solomon finished building, God met with him again. And we hear, in fact, that he met with him at night. And we hear also that God reassured him and said, don't worry, Solomon, I'm going to turn up. I'm going to be present in your temple, the temple that you've built for me. But as I read verse 7, 11, I was reminded in a slightly abstract, obtuse way of uh, the 7-Eleven shops. Now, I don't know if they still exist anymore, but when I used to live in East Dulwich, on Lordship Lane, there was a 7-Eleven, which we used to go to. And 7-Eleven means 7 till 11. That's when the shops open. It represents perhaps a little bit less commitment to being open than the 24-hour shops that we say that we see and perhaps a little bit like 24 7 prayer most of the time we don't pray 24 7 but of course prayer we can pray at any time not just 7 to 11 but 24 7 and that's what we intend to do of course during that week from the 29th of november to the 6th of december but for the Israelites and for Solomon, of course, the temple had been built. It was an amazing effort. It was an amazing uh, uh, project to complete this, this building. And of course, there is a tendency when we've completed a, a large project like that to perhaps sit back and admire our work. And of course, that, there is a time for that. And that is uh, completely legitimate and co a good thing to do. And in fact, that's what we did when we, we built our uh, in some of the rooms at the side of the church here. We had a sizable building project a few years ago and we're thinking of having another one. And it, it was great just to, to be able to enjoy that work, to enjoy the fruits of, of our labors and many other people's labor over many years. But there is a tendency sometimes, once we've got the building, to sit back. But God actually says to Solomon, look, there's a bit more to it than that. It's not just about the building. It's like God's reminding him that there's more to come. And he said, I heard your prayer. Yes, this place is special. But, but also, he says again, when? When, in verse 13, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people. When these things happen, he says, when. He doesn't say, if these things happen. He says, when these things happen. Because these things do happen. It's very relevant to us today, of course, isn't it? We think about our own situation, uh, our world today. When a financial crisis happens. When political turmoil happens when global pandemics happen where is god where is god when things go wrong but where are we and this is the point of this particular passage where god says to solomon he says when these things happen he says and this brings us to the second word the first word was when the second word is if. When these things happen, if. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. And so he's saying not when, but not if, but when. Jesus said you will have trouble. There will be trouble. There will be difficult things happen, not only in a world, on the world stage, but also in our own personal lives. Where are we going to be in relation to God and in relation to prayer? The word if, of course, is a word of condition. If we do this, so-and-so will do that. But who is God speaking to? He's saying if my people 
if my people. It begins with the people of God. Who are the people of God? The people of God are Christians. We are Christians. And yet prayer is often one of the last things that we do when it comes to a crisis. Do you remember the Chilean miners? I'm sure I've mentioned this before, but it's an amazing story. It's a true story that the Chilean miners were trapped thousands of feet under the ground for weeks and weeks. But the president of the country called upon the nation to pray and every single miner was rescued safe and sound. And that was just an amazing story of, of actually the leaders of a country, those in authority actually, in a sense, taking authority and saying, you need to pray. We are not going to be able to do this without God's help. And it is an amazing testimony to prayer. The whole country was praying. Wouldn't it be amazing if our government, if our leaders said, we're going to call the nation to prayer in this crisis that we find ourselves in. And in fact, the church leaders uh, of, of this country have actually called upon us to pray uh, during this second lockdown. Now, many people and regard us, uh, regard themselves as people of faith because they believe in a creator. But God is more specific than that when he calls upon his people. When he says, if my people who are called by my name, who are they? It says in, in, in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We can live good lives. We can even go to church. But what happens when the church is taken away? That's been our experience, of course, in, our, in the first lockdown. The church was taken away in every sense in terms of the building. But that doesn't mean the church is dead or the church is gone. But we really will only know how much we have called on his name when we look at how much it matters to us that we pray. It goes on. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. Humility is best understood when we look at the opposite. It was C.S. Lewis who said that. If you look at the opposite to humility, which is pride, then you'll realize how little or how much humility you actually have. C.S. Lewis said this, if you want to know how much pride you have, ask yourself how much you dislike it in others. Well, I think all of us can, can think about situations where we've uh, realized that, that we actually are also quite proud. I, in the last few days, I've realized that in a conversation with someone. It's, a, it's quite a measure, isn't it, about how much you actually fight back, in, in a sense, uh, in an argument. Uh, and I certainly realized, I thought, why am I doing this? And I was actually preparing for this sermon. That was the, the funny thing about it. And I realized that this was actually speaking to me. And uh, when, when, we, when we say, uh, you know, that, that we don't have something, actually, it's a bit like a mirror being held up on our face and we look at it and we see what we're really like. And in fact, it was a little bit like that in our recent discussions in our own church here on, on race. If we don't think we need to hear what our brothers and sisters are saying, then we actually do need to hear what they're saying. To be truly humble means putting ourselves into the shoes of others. It means looking at things from someone else's perspective. It means listening to someone else's pain. As someone recently said, you cannot be what you do not see. You cannot change what you do not touch. You cannot heal 
what you do not lay a hand on. This whole thing, humility, prayer, engaging more closely with each other and with God requires us to be, to get a bit closer to one another and to God. If my people who will humble themselves and pray. The more we empathize, the more we put ourselves into someone else's shoes, the more effectively we can pray. That's sometimes why we don't pray, because it makes us feel uncomfortable. Whether it be in relation to someone who's bereaved. Uh, recently I was hearing about someone who, who um, was talking about their child, someone that we know personally, who a number of years ago lost a child. And the thing that hurt them most was not, was not that, um, that people you know, find it difficult, but the fact that people just wouldn't speak to them about it. They wouldn't even just, or even just listen to them. And that was, that was, that was hard for them. Often we won't have the answers, but we can always pray. We can even just tell people that we're praying for them because we're empathized with, th with them, empathizing with them in their struggle. But it takes time to build up our prayer muscle. Like any muscle, you have to work at it. But prayer opens us up to God's power. All around us, God's power is at work and it breaks through at the point of prayer. The great evangelist, Billy Graham, said this, God's power is like an, un, an inverted triangle. God's power is like an inverted triangle. A little prayer and there's a little power. More prayer and there's more power. The less prayer, the less power there is. And the more of any, everything else that we ask into our lives, the more that that point of prayer, the point where prayer can be applied, becomes blocked with other things. It actually reminds me a bit of my old fountain pen here. This fountain pen, it's, you can refill it with ink but it dries up and over time it gets full of other stuff, other gunge, and it becomes very, very difficult to get this pen, pen to write because it's ju it just dried up and it's not flowing anymore. And it's a bit like that with prayer. The more that we do it, the more that it will flow. And the more that we do it, the more that we'll see answers and the more that our faith is increased. So do, let's pray. And so, the verse 14 goes on. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. It says if we seek God's face and turn from our wicked ways, then God will come. And that's the third word. The first word was when, the second was if, and the third is then. When we commit ourselves to prayer, God, he will hear. It was Pete Gregg who said, and I remember sharing this before because it was quite uh, relevant to what I feel like at times, he said, I may not always want to pray, but I really believe that 99% is actually just turning up. And as I've said before, that's what we feel like sometimes on a Wednesday morning, that we've just turned up. We've somehow got from our bed, our beds to, our, to sitting on a sofa in the social space, and I don't know how, what happened in between. But imagine if, if actually that, those prayers, the prayers that were prayed, have been prayed. It was about three years ago that Tim said, why don't we start praying at 6 a.m.? And at first we had quite a number of people. We had 
10, 12, 13, sometimes 15 people praying on a, on a, on a Wednesday morning at 6 a.m. But what if, because of those prayers, we're experiencing some really good things happening now, in spite of lockdown, in spite of all the difficulties and obstructions that have been put in our way, I believe that God is doing something in our church and in our community. There are things happening and it's exciting. So I encourage you to pray. I encourage you to pray at six o'clock every evening, just as part of this month, as we go through this lockdown. Maybe you'll hear the church bell or you'll, uh, you're, you set an alarm on your phone. Pray at six o'clock every day. Maybe you want to just say the Lord's Prayer when you hear the, the church bell or your alarm. But I encourage you to pray. I encourage you to take part. I encourage you to sign up uh, for our 24-7 prayer week. Because when we turn up, so does God. God who says he will hear and God who says I will forgive. God often brings to attention when we pray. He brings blind spots, blockages in our lives. Things that bind us become clear. We realize that there's things that we need to deal with so that we can be much freer, so that we can fulfill the purposes he has for us. And even at Bible study this week, we were reminded of how the power of God comes from heaven, bringing repentance and forgiveness. But often we need the power of God to help us. We can't do it on our own. God says, I will hear, I will forgive, and I will heal. As the light shines into us, so the world around us will be changed. And as someone has said, when the church is revived, the nation will feel its effects. It is probably true to say that the spiritual nation, the spiritual state of the nation depends not so much on what happens in the houses of parliament, but what happens in the house of God. And just to finish, I want to read some words from Pete Gregg, who founded 24-7 prayer, the 24-7 prayer movement. And he says this, Whenever we stop saying no to God's plans and start saying yes, his kingdom comes. It's as simple and as sensible as that. Economics, politics, the arts, education and enterprise may well be the tools God uses to heal the land. But the impetus is repentant integrity. Humility is the heavenly algorithm for social transformation. The rusty hinges of human history turns out to be the bended knee. The rusty hinge of human history turns out to be the bended knee. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for uh, the lessons that are to be learned from that short verse that when we turn to you, you do turn to us. Thank you that you will hear us, that you will forgive us, you will heal us, and you will heal our land. Amen.
as our earlier reading from Chronicles said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. Father, thank you for being so willing to listen and respond to our prayers and for those words reminding us that you're completely faithful and that you long to bring healing and rescue from sins and defeat. We want to take you at your word today, believing that you can and will forgive us and hear our prayers as we humble ourselves, confess our sins and turn to you. Teach us how to be more honest, how to say and be sorry, and how to authentically seek your face and turn in your direction. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you for the mysterious privilege and power of uniting together as church and agreeing as people who are called by your name, family together, praying to you, our Father. So we pray for your blessing and strengthening for our families, for our communities, in our work and in our daily responsibilities. As we heard those words which hold out the vision of our land being healed by you, we ask for hope and compassionate restoration where there is brokenness, sadness, sickness and other things that are difficult going on in the world. We pray for those we know who are in the midst of the overwhelming darkness of grief. We pray especially for Ray and Carol and their family as they mourn the devastating loss of their granddaughter Louise. We pray for Innes, Martin and family as they grieve losing Innes's father and granddad Laurie. May they know your deep comfort. We pray for friends and family who are sick, isolated or wrestling with other pain or struggles, remembering Les, Margaret, Amy, Carol, Mary, Iris, Joe, Bruce and his mum. And let's silently name others who are particularly on our hearts and minds. Lord, you made and intimately know each person that we have named. Please help them recognise your presence and the reality that even when unseen, you are close to the broken hearted and crushed in spirit. We ask that you would heal them and protect them, give them grace and lead them into perfect freedom and joy. As the Prince of Peace, we also ask that you'd raise courageous peacemakers in places of turmoil thinking today of countries at war or facing unrest, especially Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Syria, Mozambique. Bring an end to the loss of life and tragic devastation and heal those lands, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, whilst you keep your promises and do what you say you'll do, we often don't. Forgive us for our rebelliousness unreliability and arrogance, both as individuals and as a nation. Forgive those of us who claim to know your light in our lives and who yet, who, and yet still so often ignore it. Help us to look to you and around to others. Fill us with your life-giving Holy Spirit so that we can see and reach generously beyond our own selfish preferences and perspectives. We pray for your wisdom for all those in authority as they seek to govern in the midst of so many COVID-related challenges. In the political realm, we pray for civil discussion and listening, rather than narrow single voice shouting or solutions that forget the poor and the voiceless, or which den deny our shared humanity and ignore the common good. We pray for those struggling with fears and uncertainty regarding un unemployment, loss of income, and for those who are wor working to the point of exhaustion in this time of a second lockdown. Strengthen and lift their weary, worried hearts to see the true author of hope and source of all life. We ask this in Jesus' name. And our other reading this morning says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Father, we know that salt flavours, preserves and is used in healing. We thank you that you've said that we are like salt 
and so we pray for the areas of our influence. We don't want to be useless. Please equip and strengthen us to be salt and light in tasteless or shadowy dark places. Help us to dispel the darkness of injustice and to take time to guide those we know and love towards you. Teach us to love, forgive and serve even when it is so costly. Fill us with courage to stand for what is right with grace so that the light of your life will shine on others. We pray for those facing ethical dilemmas at work and home. May they stay salty and true. We pray for children and adults who feel powerless and insignificant. Help Christians in particular to live into the reality of your mysterious truth and hidden influence. And as we pray for the, prepare for the 24-7 prayer week at the end of November, we ask that you would inspire many people across Bermondsey to join in to pray and seek your blessing and transformation in the hidden and earth-changing place of prayerful, of praying together. We know that we can only pray with faith and for miraculous transformation if you teach us how to pray and give us your Holy Spirit. So we ask for this, in Jesus' name, Amen. In our worship together, we are so thankful for being reminded of who you are and of who we are and of our essential identity as loved children and as the salt of the earth. Help us to go into this week with the kind of welcome and compassion which you have shown us, extending your loving kindness and justice to others. We offer all these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you very much for being with us this morning. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed the worship and you've also found it helpful. And we do just hope that you also have a great week. And now I'm just going to finish with a, a final blessing. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you today and always. Amen.